So without further ado, we'll go ahead and kick things off. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this evening's Nutshell. My name is Katie Adams, and I'm the Research and Demonstration Farm Manager at the Savannah Institute. And I'm also this evening's presenter, so I'm really excited to share some of the tree crops that both the Savannah Institute and I get really jazzed about. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to answer some of the questions that you might have as well. Um, before we really dig into the details, I just want to tell you a little bit more about the Savannah Institute. If you're joining us for a second or third time on this series, uh, you might want to tune out a little bit because I'm going to share some of the things we heard before. But we're a nonprofit organization based out of Madison, Wisconsin, and Illinois focused on agroforestry research and education. So trees, like we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, we truly believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore ecosystems, build resilience, and support strong economies of cooperation between farmers, researchers, and perennial industry builders. Um, so we do this work in a couple different ways. We host on-farm educational opportunities like field days. Um, we also offer education online and through print materials, which is all available for free on our website. So we have an amazing book called Planting Trees that I'll talk about more in my presentation tonight, as well as infographics and information on um, leaf structures and all types of great things. And we also host a yearly gathering called the Perennial Farm Gathering that's coming up in December, which I'll hopefully talk a little bit more at the end of this presentation. Um, one thing that I am really excited about is our network of research and demonstration farms that we're building across southern Wisconsin and central Illinois. I'm heading up the team here in Illinois, so if you have questions about that, please shoot me an email. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central SARE. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to bring you these great presentations. Um, during this evening's discussion, if you're joining us by computer, I'm going to ask you to throw all of your questions into the chat box um, as I'm talking. And then at the end, I'll go back through and answer all of those questions to the best of my ability. And since this is a pretty widespread presentation on tree crops, if I don't have the answer, I'll at least be able to point you in the right direction. If you're joining us by phone, there will be a chance for you to ask your question. And I'll let you know when that Q&A session has started. You'll get an audio prompt from free conference call, and then you're welcome to ask your question through that. So let's go ahead and move on to the main event. So as I mentioned before, my name is Katie Adams, and I wear a lot of different hats um, as a farmer and educator. I'm the Research and Demonstration Farm Manager for the Savannah Institute, which means that I'll be heading up our three demonstration farms here in Illinois in the next year. More information will be released about that soon. I'm also lucky to be the farm manager for Midwest Agroforestry Solutions, which is a for-profit agroforestry company that does tree installation as well as runs two commercial farm properties. We grow a lot of different tree crops, including currants, which I'll be talking about tonight. Um, I'm an apprentice farmer at Seven Sisters Farm. I'm really learning the livestock side of things. Um, so that I can incorporate it into my future operation that I run with my partner, John Red Crib Acres. And we run a two-acre heirloom apple orchard on our nights and weekends. And I say all of this not to brag, but just to say that this is the kind of the reality of many farmers my age. Um, we're constantly trying to learn as much as possible and spread that bounty. Um, one quick thing, I am based in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and I just want to recognize that I currently live and farm on what is the ancestral lands of the Piami, Miami, and Sioux. Um, it's important for me to recognize the stewards of the land that came before me and to recognize that these are still living people that we should be working towards, working with. So before we get really, really into tree crops, I want to talk a little bit about knowing your site. So before we even talk about what trees work well with where you're at, we need to know where you are. One really good way to get a snapshot of where you are is by using the soil web application. So this is something that you can find on the internet simply by Googling soil web. And it's supported by the USDA. And if you type in your address or um, a latitude-longitude coordinate, 
it will pop up all this phenomenal information. So it not only has the type of soil that you're going to be working with at your site, it also gives you the slope, it can give you some drainage information that you'll really need for um, seeing what trees are suitable for you. And you can get a lot of great info not only about where your site is, but also what's around it as well. Another good way to kind of get the lay of the land so you can think about what trees are going to work best for you is to also use topographic maps. So this is going to give you the elevation. You can sort of see where your water is going to go off your land. So if we go back to the last slide, this is a research site that I manage on U of I property. And so we can see the soil. And if we come back through, oh, let me see if I can get a pointer here. Sorry. Bear with me for this. Uh, hmm. I should be able to use a pointer, but it looks like it's not going to let me do it. But it'll show the topographic um, areas, so that's really great for site design. A couple other things that I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on, but I think it's really important to talk about, is to think about what was happening on the land before you were there. What was grown there, where was it grown, and how was it grown? It'll have huge impacts on what goes into the ground afterwards and what's going to work best there. Climate, of course, is really important to think about. Not only your climate now, but what the climate is going to be like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, especially in a time of climate change. We could be thinking about different plants and varieties that might start changing zones. So like right now, my zone is 5B here in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. But in 10 to 15 years, my zone could be closer to 6, um, hopefully not more than that. Hopefully all these trees we're going to plant will help slow that down a little bit. Um, also, another thing to think about is frost pockets. So if you have a lot of changes in elevation, so if we go back to our topographic map here, um, if you have a lot of changes, it's important to see where the frost is going to accumulate, where are those dips on your landscape, where the frost is going to set down and settle. That can have huge implications on what's there as well. And wind, this is something I didn't think about um, coming from a place that wasn't so windy is that wind has huge stresses on tree crops. So we want to make sure that wherever you're putting your trees is nice and protected. Um, slope and aspect are also important. So where the slope, what kind of um, grade you have. So like a 0 to 3% slope is pretty suitable if it's well drained. Your ideal range is between 3 and 8%. Um, but once you get above 10, then it's going to be hard to do things like machine harvest, um, if you get into 15, then you might want to start thinking about contouring or key line planting, if that's something that interests you. Um, and the aspect, so which direction does your slope face? Is it to the south? Is it to the north, the east, the west? All these things are going to have impact, especially in the springtime um, when it comes to getting that sunlight and warmth. Drainage is something that you really, really, really need to know. Some tr tree crops have better drainage than others, and we'll go over that in this presentation. Um, and then basic soil testing, before you put anything in the ground, that needs to happen. And specifically with soil testing, pH. So most fruit and nut trees prefer a 6 to 6.5 pH. Um, one big thing to also consider is what's going on in the area surrounding your farm. Here in central Illinois, we have a lot of conventional corn and soy production. Um, and we have prevalent use of dicamba, which is a pretty volatile um, herbicide. So you have to think about who's spraying what where, if that's something that you need to have in the back of your mind, and how are things around you going to impact your land. So now that we've covered sort of this baseline, these baseline things, let's kind of jump into what we all came here for, which is these key tree crops for the Midwest. Um, before I really dive into these, I just want to mention that I myself am a beginning farmer. I've only been farming for seven years. Um, so these are going to be a pretty basic overview um, with information that we've gathered with help from all of our researchers and collaborators. But I am no mean an expert on any of these. I am a very young farmer um, and have a lot to learn. But 
if I can't answer questions or if you want more information, I have a huge set of resources at the end that will point you there. So the first crop we're going to start with are cider apples. This is a, something that gets me really excited, not only because my partner and I run an apple orchard, but because it has huge commercial potential here in the Midwest. So the great thing about cider apples is that they don't have the same constraint as commercial fresh eating apples. Um, they don't have to be perfect looking while stress and disease control and pest management is still really important. It's not as important as if you were selling them retail on the shelves. Um, it also allows you to grow a huge variety of apples, then cider makers usually want a mix of those. So things that have different levels of tannins and acidity and sweetness. Um, and those cider apples are classed into four different classes. So you have sweet apples, sharps, bitter sweets, and bitter sharps. That allows the grower to really have fun with varieties and see what's going to work best on your land. Um, and the zones are, and the varieties are pretty zone dependent. So you want to be growing apples that uh, work really well with what you have growing on in your growing zone. For example, some things that um, John and I have going at the orchard that we lease are Grimes Golden, Macintosh, which is a pretty familiar apple to most folks. Um, Wolf River, Cortland, Gala, which is another pretty uh, common commercial apple, and Honeycrisp. Um, if you really want a lot of information on these great cider varieties, I recommend checking out the Brick Cider website. They're a cidery based out of Mount Horeb, Wisconsin, and they have an absolutely phenomenal website with a ton of different varieties in their tasting notes and a lot of information on them. They're way more knowledgeable than I am, and we hope to have them give a nutshell next year. So um, the spacing for this is pretty dependent on what rootstock you choose. Um, the varieties that you're going to put in are going to be grafted. So you get to choose um, how you want to manage an orchard space. Um, dwarfing or semi-dwarfing rootstocks are pretty high-density plantings. But if you're interested in doing cider apples, full-size seedlings are also a great option. And they tend to have um, really great resistance and kind of uh, are a little more, I want to say durable, but that's not the right term <laughs> to use, but they, they do really well under a variety of conditions. Okay, the next crop that we'll talk about is black walnut. So this is something that exists all over central Illinois, southern Illinois, and Missouri, where I've lived, and ha is across a huge amount of growing zones. So here, four to nine, um, it does really well in. If your site already has black walnuts on the property, I highly recommend um, going through and maybe choosing or thinking about this as a potential tree crop. If it's already growing well on your property, why not just encourage it to grow better? So you can grow black walnut basically for two different things, either for timber production, um, for which you can buy pretty inexpensive seedlings and get something established pretty quickly for not a ton of money, or for nut production, um, which you wouldn't consider grafted cultivars for. And those grafted cultivars really depend on where you're at and what grows well there. So I recommend looking for a nursery in your area or a black walnut enthusiast who can guide you to the best cultivars for what you want to do. So the years to partial and full bearing and the spacing is dependent on whether you want to do nut production or timber production. You can do a combination of both um, and kind of reap the bounty of both. And one of the things that I'm really excited about black walnut is the amazing ability to be a really great crop for silvo pasture. So sheep and cattle really enjoy black walnut. Um, and because they're tannin rich, they can have um, some really great holistic health benefits for your animals as well. So full grown hogs can be trained to eat whole black walnuts. And even laying hens can feed on the shelled nuts. So planting something that's already prolific in the environment for livestock um, is a really, really great thing. One thing to mention, though, is that black walnuts um, do produce jugglone. So sensitive crops um, to that compound 
you have to be careful with what you plant there, but most things, especially other tree crops, are not affected by the juglone in black walnut. Okay, moving on to something that Michigan Institute and Midwest Agroforestry Solutions and I are really excited about, and that's chestnuts. So um, they kind of play the star role on the perennial stage. They have pretty low press pressure, they have dependable high yields, um, they have strong markets, and they're a pretty easy tree to maintain. Um, the American chestnut was a major timber species in the eastern U.S. and a valuable source of food for both humans and livestock historically, but unfortunately the imported chestnut blight has all but wiped out American uh, chestnuts. But the blight-resistant Chinese chestnuts and hybrids um, that are combinations of Japanese and European chestnuts, as well as the Chinese chestnut, are a really, really great um, tree crop. So Kevin Maxwell is on this webinar. Hi, Kevin. We just planted, uh, helped him plant quite a few chestnuts on his property, and we are really excited to see how that goes. Um, at Midwest Agroforest Solutions, we have lots of chestnuts planted out, and some favorite um, plant selections are um, of grafted varieties are Ching, Mossbarger, Louisville's Monster, and Peach. We've had great success with those um, here in central Illinois. I will say that this winter um, here in the Midwest, where it was really cold and really wet, did, did a number on some varieties, so there's still some work being done to see which ones are going to survive kind of these unpredictable conditions that come with weather patterns changing dramatically due to climate change. Um, some folks are really excited about just planting chestnuts directly into the ground for them to grow. Um, chestnuts have a pretty long taproot. So um, some experimentation is being done with planting seedlings, planting grafted varieties, and just planting the chestnut directly into the ground. Um, this is another great crop for silvo pasture. So if you're raising animals, hogs can help run through um, Chinese uh, chestnut orchards after the nuts have dropped and start cleaning some of that up. And even um, bringing in chickens and other poultry to break um, the pest cycles of the chestnut weevil, which is a pest um, for this tree crop, um, are great opportunities for silva pasture in this. So when it comes to chestnuts, and one thing I haven't talked about with other crops that I have completely missed is harvest. There's a huge consideration when you're thinking about what tree crops to put in. So um, research in Michigan determined that under two acres of chestnuts, um, they can be easily harvested by hand, but more than eight um, acres kind of favor more mechanical harvest. So um, those commercial harvesters are great because, as you can see with this photo here, chestnuts have this prickly outer shell, um, which can make harvesting by hand not so fun. Um, so mechanical harvesters, when possible, if you're thinking about going commercial scale, um, is something to think about as well. Okay, hazelnuts. So hazelnuts, um, as you notice here, there's two varieties, or not two varieties, um, two types of hazelnuts, and I'm going to be talking about the European hazelnut and the American hazelnut, and there's differences between both. Um, so it does show really great promise as low input perennial sources of food, oil, and livestock feed. So they have a great range of uses. Um, so European hazelnuts have documented resistance to the eastern filbert blight, which is a fungal disease that affects um, the European hazelnut, but not the American hazelnut. So there is breeding work being done um, between these two varieties to see if what can happen to really have the most resistance um, of hazelnuts while keeping the large nut size of the eastern hazelnut and kind of the the blight resistance and the prolific bearing of the American hazelnut. Let me back up a little bit. Um, I got ahead of myself there. American hazelnuts um, ha are a multi-stemmed um, plant, so they grow in kind of hedgerows and they get really big and bushy. And European hazelnuts um, can be trained to grow more tree-like, and that tree-like production um, is favored for commercial production 
And um, so if we can get the best of both worlds, it's going to be uh, a really great commercial crop. So the Savannah Institute is working on a hazelnut, um, a huge widespread hazelnut um, cultivation and market strategy, and we hope to be able to share some of that information with the public soon. And we're getting really excited about possibilities for hazelnuts. Um, they, some of them do have issues um, with performing due to cold winters, and especially like the winter we saw last year. Um, we're not quite ready to release varieties that um, we can say with confidence are going to be great, but we're getting close to that. Okay, aronia, um, otherwise known as choke cherry, but aronia is a much better marketing name and a much uh, pleasant, more pleasant sounding name than choke cherry, um, which grows really, really well where I am here um, in central Illinois, but also all across the Midwest. So it has a huge variety of zones that it grows in. Um, and not only is it native, but it's also a super fruit that's extremely productive and really, really easy to grow. The only drawback is due to this astringency that happens when you eat it raw. But if you process it and juice it, um, it tastes really great and it adds a huge level of antioxidants to anything that's put in. Um, right now, even though it grows really well, there's not a huge commercial market, but I'm hoping that changes really soon. We need some industry builders to really jump on that erroneous train. I mean, why eat acai when you could eat a native superfruit that can be grown here in the Midwest? Um, it can be propagated by seed or cuttings, micropropagation, root suckers. This thing grows like crazy. Um, two varieties that are great for both berry and juice production are Viking and Nero. Um, and there's also varieties that um, are suited more for wildlife production. So if you're someone that wants to attract a lot of wildlife to your property, you can plant those out because they don't have a lot of juice. So it can perform multiple different functions within your planting landscape. Um, if you want to learn more about Aronia, Blue Fruit Farm in Winona, Minnesota, has done really great work, and they have a, a variety of value-added products that turn aronia into something really delicious and beautiful. And while this crop isn't often planted for use within livestock systems, um, I raised bro uh, chicken broilers this year, and they were grazing in with the aronia next to a set of willows, and they did great. They did a really good job of weeding that area, controlling insects, and um, because it's kind of bushy, the chickens can get underneath there, and that provides protection from hawks. So I see great potential for aronia here in the Midwest. Another more shrubby type fruit are black currants. So at Midwest Agroforestry Solutions, uh, we had our first huge harvest of black currants this year. We harvested one acre of black currants with a machine harvester, and it took us only one day to wash, pack, and sort all of those berries. Um, it was around 3,000 pounds, which is our first harvest. So next year, we'll get an even larger harvest. Um, and this is a really attractive candidate for mixed agroforestry systems, because uh, they're one of the few, few fruits that produces in partial shade. So you can plant this within rows of trees, or sometimes even within row of different trees it still performs really, really well. So this might be something that most folks are not as familiar with um, as some of the other things that I've been talking about, because while they were once widely grown in the United States, an outbreak of a disease called white pine blister in the early 1920s, um, which decimated plants among, um, among other crops and trees, um, regulations were passed to protect the white pine timber industry because it was killing all of these pine trees and it was prohibited. So it was banned in the United States um, since currants were something that harbored this disease. But since then, cultivars have been developed that are resistant to white pine blister rust. And um, the market is growing, especially in Canada, and it's coming here in the United States. 
So in some areas, there is some prohibition left over from that time, even though these with the new varieties, there's no chance of that white pine blister rust. Um, so depending on where you are, you might want to check to see if you can go black, grow black currants. Um, but some really great varieties that we grow at Midwest Agroforestry Solutions that I recommend are the Chicamus, um, Stikine, Black Comb, and I really love one called Whistler. Um, really, really delicious. And the high tannic level, as well as the high pectin level, uh, makes it a really great jam berry. So we sold most of the uh, berries that we harvested this year to a jam maker, and it's, it's really, really, really phenomenal. Um, they don't need a lot of maintenance, so we'll prune um, in, the, in, the, in the winter, but you could not prune and then coppice to the ground every three years for production. Um, this is another good livestock um, bush, although I will say that if you're growing currants and you have them in with small ruminants, you're going to want to fence them out um, because, because the leaves are high in tannins. Um, sheep and goats really, really love to eat the, eat the leaves, but poultry might be good to run through after the main harvest is over. Okay, now on to another bushy thing that's very exciting. This is the Saskatoon Juneberry or service berry. Um, if you've ever lived in St. Louis or gone to visit, you'll see these bushes all over the city. Um, they've used them a lot in landscaping, and as a former resident of St. Louis, I am so thankful that they did because Right when Juneberry is ripen, you can just go out and pick as many as you want um, from the bushes in like dividers, street dividers, and in city parks, and people think you're a little bit crazy, um, but they don't know what they're missing out on because Juneberries are basically better tasting, in my opinion, better tasting blueberries that are a lot easier to grow and you don't need the acidic soil um, and the very perfect growing conditions to get them. So some plant selections are Pembina, Smoky, um, Honeywood, and Regent, and these do really well here in the Midwest. Um, they need full sun, but they're extremely, extremely, extremely low maintenance. Um, we do nothing to the um, to the uh, to the plants, like no pruning. We haven't fertilized because they're native to this area. Um, so they don't need a lot of work. A great thing that about Saskatoons, aka Juneberries, aka service berries, is that you can harvest them using the same me me mechanized harvest equipment as currants and aronia. So if having plantings of these and um, having access to a large-scale commercial harvester can be a great option. Hand harvesting um, takes, takes a longer, but the clusters are pretty easy to harvest, and individual plants can produce between four to 10 pounds of fruit per bush when it comes into full bearing, which, as you notice, only takes three years. So this can get off the ground pretty, pretty fast. Okay, I'm going to move on to um, some tree crops that I'm going to refer to as companion crops. So these have good market potential, and it could be great for incorporating into larger scale plantings. Um, but I say that, and we get to Asian pear, which I think has huge market potential. Um, I've grown a couple different varieties of Asian pear. Not only are they really delicious, and um, our people are really excited to try them, both at market um, as well as chefs, and, and I think has commercial scale up, um, ability. They're really, really easy to grow because they're fire blight resistant. So fire blight is something that affects um, both apples and pears. And while most apple varieties are very susceptible to fire blight, almost all Asian pears have that resistance. So they have, if you've never had an Asian pear, they have a crisp, juicy texture and they're very, very, very sweet. Um, and you can grow them on kind of standard or summer dwarfing rootstock, um, like apple varieties, um, Asian pears are grafted. And some varieties that I really like are Korean Giant, um, Olympic, 
and I had to put in Shinko as well. I've seen really great fire resistant, fire blight resistant on those three varieties. So um, your spacing is pretty variable, um, but you can you can incorporate these in with other shrubs, and I've seen them perform really well um, along with native plants um, under their canopy, as well as with small bush um, bush type fruits. So if you have grafted, um, you can get fruit um, within three years of planting. So that means that's about five years old. So we've had pretty large harvests off of pretty young trees with Asian pears. Okay, elderberry. This is a crop that is scaling up um, into commercial production and there's a lot of excitement around elderberry. So there's a, a Midwest elderberry collective here um, that is always looking for new growers. So um, the North American um, cultivars developed from wild plants are performing really well here. Um, and they're really easy to grow, they're really easy to propagate, and they have two product harvests. So you have elder flower, um, which has a pretty large market um, that can be used for cordials and drinks and all types of products. And then you have the elder berry, which is a really sought after medicinal fruit. Um, there's some good cultivars that are producing kind of even fruit clusters and have pretty, um, pretty proven success rates. Um, River Harvest um, elderberries are a really great resource for more information about that and they run elderberry growing school every year. And um, Terry Durham is going to be at the perennial farm gathering this year if you want to learn more about elderberries. One thing that I love about this crop is that you co can coppice them to the ground every year, um, which makes management really, really simple. One thing to, of note is that um, elderberry does have um, some issues with spotted wing dystrophila, um, and it's become a pretty major concern for commercial growers, but there are some ways to mitigate that um, using candle and clay and some good management practices. And I'm sure that Terry will talk more about that in his presentation in December. Um, this honeyberry is a crop that I don't know a ton about since we haven't grown it um, on any of the properties that um, I manage, but I've just heard super amazing things about this fruit. Um, it's growing really well in Canada right now, and it's starting to kind of move south into the Midwest. Um, and it has, as you can see, a pretty large growing zone. So going two to seven. So all the way up there in the pretty cold regions, all the way down um, into the south. So cultivars um, that are pretty um, tried and true here in the Midwest are Borealis and Tundra. And more and more breeding is um, happening to make this a viable crop for folks in warmer climates. Um, honeyberry can also be harvested by machines, so the same things that harvest those currants and aronias and service berries can also harvest this. Um, so as a integrated crop with um, livestock, it's not the best because most um, animals, especially ruminants, like eating the leaves and the berries and they like to strip the bark. Um, but you could always incorporate animals with fencing. Um, this fruit can also be eaten raw or can be processed. And while um, knowledge of this berry is pretty low in terms of retail and market customers, um, with its really cool shape, it can be a really great novelty item for farmers. Okay, if you know me at all, you know that I love pawpaws. Um, I'm pretty obsessed with this, this fruit. It's the largest fruit indigenous to North America, and people have been eating this um, since people have been on this continent. So I'm, I'm going to try to to keep my enthusiasm low because I'm, I'm running out of time here. Um, but if you're in an area where pawpaws grow, from zones five to eight, I highly encourage you to plant this fruit. Um, it has almost no pests. 
Um, it grows really well in partial um, shade, so that dappled shade makes it a really great candidate um, to plant alongside trees that are going to grow a little bit larger than that. And uh, it can be propagated in a variety of ways. So you can propagate by seed, um, which more and more folks are suggesting. Um, you can do it by vegetative or clonal propagation as well. Um, there's a lot of really great named cultivars, um, but I'm going to refrain from listing those because the cultivars, um, the grafted cultivars, are pretty dependent on where you're at and what's going to go well for your zone. So there are pawpaw enthusiasts kind of across the United States that are working on breeding um, things that do well in their area. So I know right here in Illinois that there are folks that are really working on that propagation. So Tammy Allen, I saw you're on the webinar. Um, they have um, some amazing things happening on their property with pawpaws. Um, so look for those folks that know a lot about the fruit. With pawpaw and with everything else, they're going to point you to the best selections for your area um, and really try to learn from people that have been doing this the most. Um, pawpaws are not great for livestock integration, but they have, we have lots of animals browse their bark, but goats seemingly do not like pawpaw bark. So this is something that you could think about trying out if you're, um, if you're working with livestock. Um, pawpaws produce really beautiful fruit, um, and if you want more information about pawpaws, I'm happy to talk to you via email, or Tom Wall has a really phenomenal nutshell that you can find on YouTube that has just about all the information you could think of um, to start growing pawpaws. Um, this year at Midwest Agroforestry Solutions on one of our commercial farms, we're going to be planting black locusts and pawpaws together. Um, so we have a fruit crop, we'll have a timber crop, and the pawpaws will really start to take off in the partial shade of the black locust that grows really, really quickly. Okay, the last uh, crop that I'm going to talk about pretty quickly, then we'll go into question and answer session, is the northern pecan. So we just had a field day um, with Dan Shepard, and he grows beautiful northern pecans in Missouri. So 80% of all pecans grown in Missouri are grown organically because they have exactly what they need in terms of climate, soil, drainage, and low pest and disease pressure in that area. So some areas are going to be a little bit hard to grow. So you can see we only have a zone, growing zones of six to nine. So they like things a little bit warmer, but folks are starting to experiment. Um, with growing northern pecan in more cold regions. So um, we'll see, hopefully, more work will come out of that, where it'll stay colder. Um, but with changes in climate, if you're in that kind of five, six zone, um, this might be something you experiment with. Um, and one of the most exciting things to me about pecans is that um, they can be established by grafting on the seedlings planted two or three years prior. Um, so you can really get a tree established and then graft onto that, which gives it a huge boost of, um, of really good characteristics. So the, the market for uh, northern macons is really great, both um, commercial and direct sale market, because it's something that people are already familiar with. Um, so if you're in that, warmer zone, really think about how northern Macon can be incorporated into your growing structures. So that's the end of the official presentation. I know I went through things really quickly, and I glossed over many, many, many aspects of all of these tree crops, um, but this was kind of meant to be a survey class of those three. So I have two slides of resources. Um, that I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over, but you'll get an email with all of these slides of recording this presentation, and then you'll have access to all of these resources here. So let's go plant some trees. Are you excited about all these phenomenal tree crops? Um, I am. 
So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and start going through the questions that folks might have dropped in the chat box. And I'm going to go through the questions in the chat box first. Um, and if you have a question via the phone, I'll open that up here in a few minutes. So let me go through and see if I can look at the comments without Xing out of my presentation. Give me one second. Okay. So Kim was asking if I could talk more about the machine harvester we use for the black currants. Sure, I'm realizing that I should have put the um, current harvester in with the presentation, but I'm going to go ahead and just Google it so you can see it, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that works. So the harvester that we used was a Joanna Harvester. Let's see if I can make this bigger. And it's a machine that comes out of Europe and it's a side straddle or harvester. So the, the way it works is it's pulled behind a tractor um, and then it straddles the, the row of berries. And there's two, there's a series of tines that are rotating um, and shaking the, the bush. And then the berries are dropping on the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt goes to the back of the implement. And then there's one or two people on the back who are sorting through the berries um, to pick out the best ones. So with that, it takes the harvest hours down a lot. And because it's a multi-crop harvester, it can be used for, for a variety of things. So currants, aronia, um, honeyberry, and juneberry can all be used using this harvester. Um, we are really lucky that we farm near a land grant university that owns one of these harvesters. So we were able to rent the harvester from the university. So if that is something that is near you, um, I would check into that. Or one thing that I get excited about is um, banding together with our other farmers to invest in a harvester. So if there's other farmers or growers in your region that are thinking about putting acres into production, um, talk and network with them to see if this could potentially be a expense that farmers could share together. So the more that we can um, share resources to bring the cost down, and the more we'll all be able to share in the profits. Okay, next question was, can grafted black walnuts for nut production also be used for timber eventually? Absolutely. The only thing that makes a difference is that grafted black walnuts have a, a more expensive starting price. They're gonna pay more per tree for a black to graft walnut versus a seedling black walnut, and the spacing is gonna be different. But I don't see any reason why you couldn't um, plant your, if you're doing a larger scale orchard, plant grafted black walnuts and then eventually harvest them for timber. Um, that's not something that I know a ton about, um, but like most tree crops, chestnut included, you can get the nut production and then get the um, timber production once the, the nut production drops off. So Sherry asked, how are the nuts of black walnuts commercial? Um, that is, do you have your own processing or other operations that take the nuts and process? Either or, depending on where you are, um, you might be able to take black walnuts to a processor and they will be able to process, or you could pay someone to come and collect your black walnuts and then they take them to the processor, or you can have your own processing equipment. One of the huge things that we're seeing as a need here in the Midwest for nut production is access to shared processing facilities. So one thing that the Savannah Institute is going to be working on is seeing, can we scale up this nut industry by creating hubs of processing um, across the Midwest? Is, will that allow folks to invest their money in growing really high quality nut crops and 
not having to worry so much about the processing facilities. So depending on where you are, um, kind of all of those options could be possible. So Christina asked, do we have a nutcracker to recommend for the American hazelnuts? There, I don't have a good answer for this one because I, I have a nutcracker that's run on a drill and I have no idea what the name of it is. Um, but I can ask some folks and um, include that in the follow-up email, Christina. And if folks have a recommendation, go ahead and drop it in the chat box. Um, H.D. Hilton is asking what the Michigan farm of the Aronia was being discussed. Oh, it's um, Blue Fruit Farm, and it's Winona, Minnesota. So, um, yeah, Blue Fruit Farm. They grow all blue fruit. It's pretty amazing. Okay, if no one has any more chat box questions, and we still have a little bit of time, so if you have some burning questions, go ahead and drop them in the box. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open the Q&A session for folks on the phone. So if you're joining us by phone, um, get those dialing fingers ready, um, and you'll receive instructions on how to get in the queue for that in a couple of seconds. So if you're joining us by phone, dial star six, and you'll be put in the queue to ask a question. I'm going to leave this open for a couple of seconds. Okay, it looks like folks um, don't have any questions joining us by phone. So to kind of wrap up today's discussion, um, I know it was, it was pretty quick, um, but I just want to state that planting trees is one of the most impactful things we can do to combat climate change. And if we can plant trees in a way that not only regenerates the land, and generates the soil around us, but also allows us to grow an economy of farmers and processors and eaters, um, then we can really start changing not only this climate crisis that we're facing, um, but also help build really strong economies, especially in rural and urban areas. Um, so I, I highly recommend that you look into what tree crops are going to grow well where you are and start planting trees on a scale that works for you. So anywhere from your backyard or a small urban plot all the way up to large acreage um, into production. So I'm going to go ahead and close out um, by putting up the resource slides so that folks can get that information, but I'll also include it in with the follow-up email. Um, if you have any questions on tree crops, um, be sure to check out our book, Planting Trees, which I totally forgot to mention. Um, you can find that for free on our website, savannainstitute.org. And you can always shoot me an email at katie at savannainstitute.org. So thank you so much for joining us. I'll throw back up those resource slides. Um, have a great night and happy tree planting.